Peace is not simply an option on the table, to be served up like some dessert or some reward. It is what is necessary at this time to defend civilization as a whole from blowing up in the wake of this dead empire. The violent conflagration of what was once the Ottoman Empire is a long calculated patient plan in defense of the British Empire. As we here at LPAC have documented in the feature-length production's firewall in 1932, a key threat to the existence of the last empire is a peaceful development of rail from Berlin to Baghdad, breaking the back of geopolitical domination by sea power by connecting the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean and thus on to the Pacific, with the potential of connecting Europe to Africa by land. And a quick look at the map will show you the strategic significance of Israel and Gaza if we are going to pull Africa out of the dark age hell we've put her through, while pulling the rest of the world out too. We here in the United States, when we follow our constitutional tradition, are world renowned as an instrument of peace and development. In the summer of 1919, Henry King and Charles Crane led a commission into the former Ottoman Empire to find out what it would take to begin to secure a lasting peace. In their report of the American section of the Inter-Allied Commission on Mandates in Turkey, of which commission only we Americans filed the report, they documented their findings of a well-thought-out petition for political reconstruction of the region as a whole and an overwhelming desire for the, an American hand in seeing that reconstruction through. Had we followed the recommendations of that American report, the empire would already have been dead long ago. Now what they also found was evidence of the Sykes-Picot arrangement between Britain and France, and in their report they outlined the effects of this and other secret arrangements for the colonialization of the region as a whole. Now the details of the Sykes-Picot arrangement have been documented by Executive Intelligence Review, and some of the machinations of how Empire has been operating in this region since will be more thoroughly discussed in the next issue of that magazine. At the time, the overwhelming request for an American hand in these foreign affairs and the obvious methods of Britain drew the attention of the U.S. military. Shortly after the report was issued, the Army began to draw up what would come to be called War Plan Red, a plan of action for our defense in an outright war against Britain herself. In a September 1919 lecture on this potential threat, Lieutenant Commander Holloway H. Frost of our Navy said the following. It is evident that no nation which bases its prosperity on trade can exist with an adverse trade balance of four billions annually, a figure which the British estimate will increase in the near future rather than decrease. The United States is the direct cause of this adverse trade balance. If it develops that we can successfully compete with England on the seas, this adverse balance will be maintained. A nation doomed to commercial defeat will usually demand a military decision before this commercial defeat is complete. Therefore, there is always the possibility that the British, however friendly they may wish to be, may be forced into a war to maintain their commercial supremacy of the seas, which is essential to the existence of the British Empire. This kicked off an active investigation and planning of what it would take to lick the Brits in war, which was continued and refined until 1936 when it was declared obsolete. Of course, many of the projected targets of a British invasion, such as the Pittsburgh steel production, have since been destroyed of our own volition by the ingestion of British free trade economic policies. The Brits never gave up. Unable to defeat us militarily, especially after FDR's revival of the American system of political economy, a revival he had intended to spread throughout the post-war world, the British have induced us to destroy ourselves by dragging us into impossible wars, such as the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, and by inducing in our culture the immorality required to wage such war. This type of cultural induction has been outlined in LaRouche's statement of this past December 30th, the only threat to Israel is an outbreak of peace. The hardliners thrive on having an enemy to have a hard line against. What were to happen if that enemy were neutralized through a lasting and sustainable peace? Certainly, at least, the hardliners would have to zip it up for good. Now, this sort of peace, which could be achieved relatively immediately, the pieces are all in place should we Americans pursue it, this peace would create the conditions whereby many political groups conditioned by this Sykes-Picot mentality would have no reason any longer to exist. For nearly a century, the British-dominated geopolitics of the Middle East have determined the very identity of many political groups throughout the world. We can see an example of this sort of cultural warfare here in the United States. 
under a Truman administration, marching lockstep with Britain's Churchill, the Red Scare was fostered, fomenting an enmity with the same USSR that lent crucial support in defeating Hitler. Right after the collapse of that Soviet Union, beginning with the World Trade Center bombing of 1993, a new enemy was heaped upon public opinion to keep this imperial game going, Islamic terror. And under a British-dominated Cheney-Bush administration, this enemy image has been utilized in true imperial form. Who would suffer the most from a lasting, durable peace? To what lengths would these factions, these pawns of empire, go to protect their grand game? Take a step back for a moment from the atrocity being committed right now in Gaza. Look at the crises developing in Africa under British direction. Look at the British hand in Mumbai. The 16 words which got the green light for Cheney's war were of Downing Street infamy. The narco-terror being accelerated in Mexico right now is the policy of George Soros, a known agent of the British Foreign Office. Mexico has been a strategic consideration since War Plan Red. Our military planners knew then that in order to destroy the American Republic, you had to destabilize her southern border. And today, three quarters of a century later, that's exactly what's happening. The empire has been patient, but the empire is out of time. This imperial system of political economy is dead, and their last move is to cause chaos to prevent any alternative from surfacing. Now, in Chinese, the same word which denotes crisis also means opportunity, and in this time, the opportunity is immense. The solution to this existential civilization-wide crisis means the durable and prosperous peace that is in the bones of the American tradition and it means the end of empire. As Lyndon LaRouche has recently said, we could embark on this noble mission the afternoon that President Obama is sworn into office.